damn late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing their army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing our friend Gareth Porter. The great Gareth Porter, he's the author of the book on Iran's nuclear program. It's called Manufactured Crisis, fittingly. Um, the definitive book on Iran's nuclear program. Also, he writes a lot of great articles, and we got three of them to discuss today. First and foremost here at the American Conservative Magazine, translated doc debunks narrative of Iran-Al-Qaeda alliance. Welcome back to the show, Gareth. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me again, Scott. Hey, listen, I'm really happy to have you here, and I'm happy that I have you to rely on to do this work for us, man. As always, uh, the ever-reliable Gareth Porter here. Um, and so when you say in your headline, translated doc, you actually are talking about the same document that everyone else is citing, saying that, aha, see, Iran is behind al-Qaeda and their war against America. Gareth? Exactly, yes. It, it is indeed the, the document that has been written about extensively in the mainstream media as uh, uh, basically confirming all these uh, uh, stories over the years that are legion. I mean, there are too many of them to even count, uh, although I have a very thick file full of them, that said that uh, Iran is believed by U.S. intelligence uh, or by somebody else in the U.S. government to be uh, consorting with al-Qaeda, supporting al-Qaeda terrorist activities, essentially. So, so this, uh, this is the actual document that is the source of all these stories that came out around November 2nd, uh, 3rd. Uh, and and uh, basically, I'm quite convinced that none of those people who wrote those stories ever had access to a translated uh, version of the uh, document itself. They were relying on uh, the Long War Journal, which I think some of your uh, listeners, maybe most of your listeners may be aware, is uh, part of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, which is, of course, a an Israeli lobby institution, essentially. And they have a very, very strong propaganda uh, position on this on this issue, and we're promoting it through their uh, very uh, summary version of what the document is all about. Mm -hmm. And that well, was, I, it seems to me, quite clear that that is what the basis of the stories in the mainstream media was. That, that it was all about uh, a couple of quotes and a summary by the uh, Long War Journal. Mm -hmm. And and the CIA director arranged. For this to be given, and not through the DNI's office, right? Just straight from the director of the CIA, right. Uh, right, right. he gave it to this pro-Israel think tank, as you describe it here, uh, over there at the Long War Journal. Th that's right, Scott. And and in fact, you know, one one can make a very strong argument that this represents perhaps the apotheosis of the politicization of the CIA and of the intelligence community in general. I mean, they, they are uh, always politicized. Let, let, let's start with that as the fundamental uh, fact of the matter. They are always politicized. They always have been to some extent. It varies depending on the individuals and on the administration and the situation. And, and I would argue that this, this represents the absolute nadir of, uh, of that process of politicization of, of the CIA with uh, the current uh, leadership. Uh, it, it's it's really a uh, a fiasco, I must say. Hmm. Well, and you know they had this whole narrative too. Beyond, aha, see Iran backs Al Qaeda. 
they say, and there's been a cover up this whole time too, right? And they they portray this as, you know, geez, and here we thought Saddam backed them, but it turned out it was the Ayatollah <laughs> all along. And so all that all that framing makes it seem like there's really a basis for them to conclude that but instead it's all start with the conclusion and the basis isn't really there there's your claim anyway the basis is not there and and in fact you know i mean there is this very long history of leaks and uh, outright public statements by people within the bush and obama administration now the trump administration really making a very uh, clear argument that iran was uh, in cahoots with Al Qaeda, uh, beginning particularly with the run up to the Iran uh, to the U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, that's that's when that reached its peak. Uh, and and uh, I've written something about this in the past, but but there's much more to be written about it. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so now longtime listeners of this show are familiar probably with. Oh, surprise, surprise! It was your story back when for the American Prospect burnt offering about Iran's, um, it wasn't just an offer to, to deal on issues like Al-Qaeda, but to deal everything, to put the nuclear program on the table, support for Hamas and Hezbollah on the table, and certainly cooperation against Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, against Saddam Hussein and the, the uh, American you know, support for America's policy in Iraq. And the Americans didn't want to deal with them at all. And so, but anyway, the, the, the biggest part, I think, the most notable part of that was their offer to trade captured al-Qaeda guys for members of the mujahideen e Kalk, Iranian communist terrorist cult that had been working for Saddam Hussein and were, you know, basically holed up in Iraq, uh, stateless uh, in Iraq, and then had been inherited by the U.S., I guess, by Rumsfeld. And before CIA, I don't know who, but anyway. Right, um, right. Scott, you, you are one of the few people in this country who uh, remembers very clearly that episode and understands its significance. And, and I didn't get into that in this article, but it and clearly And in fact, you know what? For Damon, for the show notes and, and for people Googling along at home, what you do is you type in uh, Gareth Porter, Iran offer, and then, but make sure and add .pdf. And what you'll find is there's an IPS news page. It's not the prospect report. The prospect report maybe has it too. But there's an IPS news page that has a dead link at the bottom, but the link is correct. <laughs> but the link is not lit up. But it's a dead link. So if you search and add that .pdf, I bet you can find it. And then that PDF is the actual offer that the Iranians gave to the Americans through the Swiss ambassador who then was insulted and, and dressed down for daring to even bring the Iranian offer to the Americans' attention. So, so the significance of that episode is that it was precisely at that time in early 2003 when that offer was formulated. And the previous months in 2002, uh, 2001, 2002, that Iran was at, its, uh, at the height of its desire to cooperate with the United States in counterterrorism, as well as, of course, as you uh, have said, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and it was at that point that the events that were transpiring in, uh, re with regard to Iran's dealing with al-Qaeda presence in, uh, in Iran, that, uh, that this, uh, this, this document that has been written about, and which I've now uh, read the full document, or or I've had the document read to me in English uh, all the way through, and uh, reported on in this piece. And what it shows is that Iran uh, clearly, you know, ha was up against a, a serious challenge here with not just hundreds but thousands of Al Qaeda people uh, moving from Afghanistan into Pakistan and then from Pakistan being ordered to go into Iran. Now, most of those people, this document makes clear, entered Iran illegally. They were smuggled into Iran. They were not given, uh, you know, a pass to go into Iran through a border outpost where, you know, they showed some sort of document. They, they got in illegally. And th this is uh, a very important piece of the puzzle because that was the problem the Iranians were up against. Now, there were also a much smaller group 
that entered Iran with passports that they'd gotten or they had passports stamped at the Iranian uh, uh, the, the Iranian uh, consulate, I guess, in Peshawar or Karachi, I guess it was Karachi where they where they got the, the passport stamped. But and those people actually did uh, uh, obviously approach the Iranian government asking uh, to be able to allow to stay there or to pass through. And uh, and I talk about that in some detail in the piece. Uh, and the Iranians agreed to do that uh, on very, very strict uh, security uh, conditions that they could not do anything involving organization or using their cell phones. They could not communicate with anybody, uh, so so that they made sure that they, that there was nothing that would happen that the Americans would find out about, or if they did find out about it, they were going to react and and turn these people in uh, immediately. So so that that is the um, uh, that's the background of this. Then there were thousands more who were hiding in Iran during this period from uh, from basically early 2002 uh, to, to, to 2003. And it was those people that the, that the Iranians were really worried about. And so what they did was to follow the people that they knew had entered very closely to try to get uh, intelligence about the ones who were hiding. And uh, within a matter of months, they began to arrest both the people who had come legally and some of the people who were hiding, and uh, they got more intelligence, and then a few months later they struck again and arrested as many of them as they were able to find. That That's the story in a nutshell. That's the story that I tell in the piece. Mm -hmm. All right, now, so it also seems like you make a couple of uh, concessions to the uh, WinEP narrative here, <laughs> whatever, the FDD narrative here. Right, that the FDD narrative. The, the author of this, again, this is supposedly, we don't even know, it's an anonymous um, document, but you're saying it, it seems genuine to you and it's from some kind of, you know, mid to possibly like upper middle manager type working for Al-Qaeda, which it's a pretty small group, I don't know. Um, uh, back then anyway it was. Right, a few um, dozen, perhaps, yeah. And then, but so you're saying, uh, you you saying here that it is true, as these guys highlight, that the Iranians had offered them money and arms and training with Hezbollah. I mean, that when I heard that, I was like, come on, this is made up. Like this document probably isn't even true at all. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. They're going to go to the Bekaa Valley in well, Lebanon and go sense. hang out with Hezbollah. This is stupid. But you're, you're saying right. that, yeah, no, that's really in there. So what do you make of well, that? He, he did say that in the document. There's no question. He says it in the document. But whether it happened is another question entirely. And what I suggest in this piece is that, uh, first of all, the guy, you know, was not even there. He, he didn't he didn't witness or or have immediate knowledge of anything of the sort. He was hearing about this supposedly. OK, he supposedly heard about this later from people because this guy wasn't even there. When the people before the people were arrested, he wasn't even there. He arrived after the first round of arrests, the first wave of arrests, and so so he he didn't really know precisely what had transpired. And uh, look, what, what was really in other going words, on, it certainly wasn't that they had made this offer to him. He was saying what he had heard. No, somewhere. no, of course not. Yeah. No, of course not. And and what what clearly happened here is that the Iranians were cultivating these people who had. Uh, who had arrived legally, uh, you know, telling them that they were heroes or, or, you know, intimating that they admired them and so on and so forth. And, oh, gee, it would be great to collaborate with you guys, you know, uh, you know, in the abstract sort of uh, uh, mode and uh, getting them to be, you know, all, not defensive, but but to trust them as much as possible. So they get information from them. And you're telling and, me in context, that's clear in the document that that's what's yeah. going on here at yes. best is the that's Iranian right. counterintelligence forces are dealing with these guys the best that they can but not using them and not planning on using them against anyone. exactly and and I point out that that the that the specific individual the Saudis that he claims were told that they would that they would get or they were offered uh, you know arms and training and money uh, were the ones who were actually deported back to Saudi Arabia. Now, that obviously doesn't add up. I mean, it's just not 
conceivable that the Iranians planned to do anything with these people because they're the very people that they deported back. Now, you know, they, I'm sure that they told them stuff to gain their confidence. And, you know, we don't know what it was. Maybe they said something like that to them. But clearly, they had no intention of, of doing that whatsoever. This was during a period, again, when they had, uh, you know, no use for al-Qaeda. They knew that they had to expel them. They knew that they had to capture them, arrest them, put them in prison as much as possible, or deport them out of the country. And so uh, th this, this is clearly a, a story that uh, does not mean what it appears to mean at all. Mm -hmm. And now... Do I read you right here that you say that they had captured Zarqawi, but then they turned him loose? Uh, they they did capture Zarqawi, according to this guy, as part of the, uh, uh, I can't remember this moment, whether it was the first or second round. I think it was the first round, but I'm not sure. Um, and he was deported to Iraq. Now, wh when I say deported. And he was actually uh, not a member of Al-Qaeda at the time, by the way. He just later would found Al-Qaeda in Iraq. He, about a year and a half after America invaded that country. Well, I mean, that, that, that's probably a distinction that, that could have some significance. I'm not sure. But in any case, um, they put him on the border and said, get out of here, you know, find your own way. Uh, he was not deported to the authorities in Iraq, as was the case with uh, the Saudis. There, there was a distinction made. The, the he Saudis was Jordanian and wanted by them. I don't know right, if he was right. wanted by the Americans at that point. Right, right. So, so there is a distinction there. But um, in any case, they they uh, just told him to get out and and you know get it. You know, he's on his own. That that's the way it was left. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know what? Not to harp too bad on it, but might as well. There's some really great reporting out there. For all I know, uh, by you as well about how. The military begged George Bush for authority to kill Zarqawi and his small group when they were hiding up in American protected autonomous Iraqi right, Kurdistan right. before yeah, the he war. Went to Kurdistan, and they that's told right, him exactly. no over and over again because Colin Powell needed his fake talking point that Zarqawi was the link between Saddam and Osama, uh, even though he wasn't a member of Al Qaeda. He had turned down Osama's offer to join Al Qaeda. He wanted to fight Jordan, not America. And then Saddam's only connection was he was in quote unquote Iraq, as Colin Powell put it, but he was safe up in American Iraqi Kurdistan, really, that had been autonomous under American protection since 1990. And uh, very, very good point. Very good point. In other words, they were, uh, as is often the case, using a threat to justify something that was more important to them. And right. so they and they lied that they said right. Saddam had given him medical treatment and all this stuff when in fact Saddam had just put out an APB for the guy. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the the dishonesty here has no bottom. Has no there, there's no bottom to the dishonesty uh, that we have seen on the part of the U.S. national security state. And this is a very good example of it. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys, here's how to support this show. First of all, sign up for the feeds at scotthorton.org. Second of all, go to scotthorton.org slash donate. And uh, if you go there, if you donate $20 now, usually PayPal is the easiest way to do it. Then you go to the front of the line to get the audio book when it comes out. I swear, I'm working on it. It's coming out soon, but I got to, hey, I'm meticulous. What can I say? Uh, you like that about me. Uh, I'm working on it. It's coming out. Anybody donates $20 now, you go to the front of the line to get the audio book for Fool's Air and Time to End the War in Afghanistan. $50 donations to the Scott Horton Show, and you get a signed copy of the book in the mail there. $100 donation, you get a QR code, silver commodity disc. You scan it with your phone, you get the instant spot price. It's the greatest invention in the history of currency. Uh, $200 donation to the Scott Horton Show gets you a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think Libertarian Audiobooks from listenandthink.com. And uh, you can also sign up to do... Uh, regular subscription donations, uh, monthly donations at PayPal, 5, 10, 20, 50 bucks. Those are great if you want to do that. And if you sign up at patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show uh, for more than a dollar or a dollar or more per interview, I mean, you get two free audio books from Listen and Think Audio. That's at patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show. And the rest and all that is at scotthorton.org slash donate. Also, uh, shop amazon.com. All your Christmas shopping and all that stuff, you know, by way of the link 
on the front page of scotthorton.org. And leave me a good review on iTunes or Stitcher. Come on, man. You love the show. Go and write about how much you love it. And uh, if you read the book and you like the book, review it on Amazon for me, too. That'd be nice. You know, I haven't heard from them for a while, but I, I think they wrote a thing recently. Have you heard from Flint and Hillary Mann Leverett, who um, they were the source uh, that you relied on for quite a few pieces along these lines back when? Uh, they were both officials in the U.S. government at the time. I don't know exactly who was in which role, but they were both at one time or another on the Bush administration's National Security Council. And I know Flint was formerly a very high-level analyst at CIA. Right, and, right. And they told the story. I know I cite Hillary Manlevered in my book, uh, saying that the Iranians were cooperative. You know, from the very beginning, they said 9-11 was basically their opportunity to try to make friends with America and get a rapprochement there. And there was an obviously very officially sanctioned candlelight vigil of more than a million people in Tehran on September the 12th. Uh, exactly. You're you're absolutely right. It was and they said, hey, let us help you in Afghanistan. Let us help you with Saddam. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> and, right. Uh, and, and this is the this is the uh, point that I make very strongly in my uh, article that you led with. But wait, uh, maybe up. I'm not cynical enough, because actually we're talking about those sneaky double dealing carpet salesmen, those the Persians. And, and also <laughs> we're talking about theocrats, which are the worst kind of politicians, and I hate all politicians, so maybe I'm being naive, and maybe the Ayatollah really is, you know, must be a double-dealing SOB. Hell, if the CIA can back Al-Qaeda, then the Iranians can, right? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, there was a time when when Iran was uh, friendly with with, uh, Al-Qaeda and with bin Laden. I mean, that was both during you mean when and when they helped Bill Clinton arm them in Bosnia in 1995 immediately bef- uh, during and uh, immediately after the US backed war of the mujahideen in Afghanistan because they were on the same side i mean the the Rabanians yeah. were fighting uh, you know they were uh, against the the soviet troops in afghanistan the soviet uh, uh, occupation of afghanistan and bin laden and the americans were against that so they were both on the same side and that continued you know after the soviets withdrew the 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 war continued and uh, the mujahideen were trying to gain power and and uh, the taliban got there first and so on and so forth but you know nevertheless they were still on the same side in 91 92 um, and uh, 93, I suppose, but somewhere along the line between 93 and 98, when the Taliban killed 12, uh, or was it 11 Iranian diplomats in uh, Afghanistan, the Iranians began to lose enthusiasm for Al Qaeda and Taliban. So yeah. that was that was a big shift in their policy, no question about it. Yeah. Well, and Bill Clinton did, you know, at least look the other way, and I think more likely really facilitated. Iranian weapons transfers to the Mujahideen in Bosnia in 1995. Right, and in fact, right, right. a CIA officer, Cynthia Storer, confirmed that on my show. Um, oh, good for you. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a great find. That, that's a great story. And in fact, you know what? It's that freak John Schindler, the former <laughs> NSA guy. He wrote a whole book about this back then. About And I haven't read the book, but I, I guess I read you know an article about it and I, I looked at it. And it was a very critical take on... You know, that scumbag trader Bill Clinton and all his support for ah, the Mujahideen uh, in Bosnia yeah, and then later yeah. in Kosovo, which, of course, is exactly correct. Right. You know, depending yeah. on which part is inside you're on at which time, I guess. And he really objected to that, that, you know, here Al Qaeda was already attacking the United States and Bill Clinton's still backing him anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's right. And, and I mean, the Clinton administration was so focused on Iran and Hezbollah. It really did not care. We've talked about this before many times, I'm sure. Yeah. They really did not care about Al-Qaeda uh, through 96, 97, 98, 99. Well, as we talked about, blaming the Kobar Towers attack on Iran yeah. instead of Osama was a right. huge part of that. Because what if it had come out that like, hey man, the guy that blew up the World Trade Center and tried to knock one tower down into the other in 93, his uncle and Osama bin Laden just killed 19 of our airmen in Saudi. What if that had been the narrative, not some murky nonsense about Iranian-backed Shiite Saudi Hezbollah? Yeah, as I said in my series on that, the, the very last piece, I remember very clearly what I said was that precisely what you just said. If the narrative had been uh, that that it was Al-Qaeda that did this, you know, presumably 9-11 would never have happened because 
both Clinton administration and the incoming administration would have had no choice but to make that their highest priority. And that's, of course, exactly the opposite of what happened. By the way, I guess I should say, that same former CIA analyst, uh, Cynthia Storer, also said that, oh yeah, no, Iranian-backed uh, Saudi Shia Hezbollah did do that attack, but I can't tell you how I know that it's classified, <laughs> but trust me, they did. And yeah. I said, well, Gareth Porter and uh, Michael Scheuer and all these people have said, nuh and she said, yeah, well, trust me, so. Well, I mean, I've heard, that. That. I've, I've heard that from other people in the intelligence community at that time, um, and I I just don't believe it. I mean, I, I think the, the evidence is, is just too strong on the other side. And, and I interviewed, I didn't talk about this in my piece, but I interviewed John Brennan uh, for, for that series really? of pieces that I did on Cobar Towers. And I found him so unpersuasive that I didn't even uh, mention it. I mean, his argument was, well, we had these two pots of, of evidence. And one pot was the evidence that uh, Al-Qaeda did it. And the other pot was the evidence that Hezbollah did it, or you know, Hezbollah and its friends, the Saudi Hezbollah did it, and we found that one pot was very small and one pot was very large. <laughs> uh-huh. and so I I decided it's not even worth mentioning this, uh, but but I found him to be uh, very, uh, shall we say, untrustworthy. Yeah, man. All right, listen. Um, so there's so many more things here. Uh, talk to me about what it means for al-Qaeda to be hiding in Iran for all of these years, or not necessarily hiding. I mean, there's two different kinds of hiding. There's hiding out from the Americans who are occupying Afghanistan and Iraq to the east and the west. But then there's also, as you say, you know, guys who were just uh, illegal immigrants basically hiding somewhere in Iran, right. even from Iranian authorities. Very, very but then there were guys who that. supposedly were under house arrest. and then But there were other takes that said, no, they were in prison prison. Uh, no, maybe no, no, it's they, some of each, or maybe that that's cover that actually they were living comfortable. I think I've seen, I don't know, David from types or whatever saying, man, these guys were guests of the Iranians. They weren't under house arrest. They're, you know, treated great. Okay. Let me clarify this. And, and I could have, and perhaps should have spent more space on this point in, I mean, I, I should have gotten into this point in my latest piece and didn't. But it's very clear that they put them in prison. They were imprisoned. Okay, it was not. It was not some villa somewhere. They're put in prison, and then and they and they allowed them to be visited by their wives and families. Um, and then there was a prison break. There were some people who escaped in the confusion of wives visiting them. Uh, this is this is the story told in this uh, long nineteen-page. Uh, 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 article or, or, or paper. And so then they decided to have the families move in with them so they didn't have this confusion. And so there were, there was a different physical location for that purpose, but nevertheless, they're still, it's not just house arrest. They are still in prison, but it's conditions with, with the family accompanying them. Mm. And, uh, and even Obama administration officials admitted, acknowledged, as I point out in my piece, that they were not able to communicate with the outside. There was, there was no way that they could do anything from the position they were in, uh, imprisonment in, in uh, this, this location. It wasn't, wasn't in Tehran, it was outside of Tehran. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that, that much is clear. Now, th- there's, there's another group, however, the larger group of illegals who, who were escaped, who escaped arrest, those people were depending on the help of uh, the, the Baluchis and Kurds in Zahidan and elsewhere in that part of uh, Sistan, Baluchistan, which is a, a border province that is full of uh, people who don't like the regime in Tehran. Uh, they're, they're people who supported them from the time they arrived and were part of that illegal network, part of that illegal organization. So. So, so they have been, and these taking, would have been the same. This would have been the same community base of support for Jandala that CIA right, and exactly. Mossad were using to attack the Iranian regime with. Exactly, and by the way, the the author of this piece that I had translated for me and which I'm reporting on says explicitly. I didn't talk about this. That you know, the, the fact is that it's true. The United States did support the 
the, the Jundala folks. He, he doesn't name it, but it's clear that's what he, who he's talking about. The CIA did support them. <laughs> he, this he confirmed document, that. What's, it, yes. what's the date on this thing again? It was written around 2007. And in there he says... All this stuff about, oh, yeah, they offered to have Hezbollah train us in Lebanon. Yeah, yeah. He says yeah. in there, oh, yeah, and the CIA's been around helping Jandala out? Yes, yes, yes. Talk about burying the lead, Porter. No, it's another story. It's another story entirely. God damn. It's another story damn. entirely. All right, well, That's and of the- course, you know, I actually am lost now. It's been too long, and I don't remember, but it was... Was it, um, it was Mark Perry, right, who reported that, no, it wasn't CIA, it was Mossad pretending to be CIA. That's right. That did that's that. Right. That's right. But then exactly. I don't remember whether that stood up or whether later reporting said, nah, it was both or one then the it other. It could be both, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's that would be my reading of it, but, you know, it's it certainly bears further, further, uh, in investigation, I would say. You would think that I could keep all of this straight, but not always. <laughs> All right, so, Gareth, who's this uh, Safe al Edo guy? And, and there was some controversy about him because he supposedly, well, uh, they've been holding him all that time. We could have traded MEK for this guy way back when, but since we didn't, they held him long enough to trade him in a hostage negotiation? Yeah, yeah. First of all, of course, you're absolutely right in pinpointing and recalling the, the fact that, the crucial fact that the neocons in the Bush administration insisted on no... Uh, trading of of intelligence with Iran, which meant that they passed up the opportunity to get key intelligence on uh, on Al Qaeda at that point, and even you know having access to the senior people that they had, they wouldn't do it. And as a result of that, of course, uh, Saif al Adil was one of the people that they held, senior Al Qaeda official, um, and and he was. Uh, in prison uh, uh, in in Iran from 2000, uh, 2002 until 2015. And then because the, the Al-Qaeda people had, uh, had seized uh, at least two uh, Iranian diplomats, one in Peshawar and one in, um, I guess it was... Uh, Yemen, it was in Yemen, uh, the Iranians were forced to make a, a prisoner uh, 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 trade with, with al-Qaeda in 2015, and Saif al-Adil then was returned to al-Qaeda under that, under that deal. Yeah, see how bad that looks in a vacuum out of proper context? About exactly. how it didn't have to be that way? Uh, look exactly. what those Iranians did. Well, after we put them in that position, could have yeah. had them a long time ago. And just so that we could hold on to the MEK, Gareth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what use just are those so guys anyway? Just so they could have that option. You know what? In fact, let me ask you about this. I mean, it's said that it's MEK guys that did the assassinations of the Iranian nuclear scientists. But I wonder if that's even true, whether it was whether MEK uh, is even that useful as I, murderers. I doubt that you know? very much. I doubt that very much. I don't think Mossad would trust the MEK to do that at all. They, they have their own people. I mean, the wife reported that Rumsfeld and Cheney were using them to collect intelligence inside Iran. And I think Scott right. Ritter at one point said they had done a bombing or two or something. But all those targeted assassinations seem a little sophisticated for a bunch of nuts like them. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm quite convinced that Mossad uh, has their own people that they train and uh, – that that's not that's not the kind of thing that they do with MEK. All right, hang on just one second again. All right, you guys, here's a couple of books for you to read. No Dev, No Ops, No IT. And those are one word each. No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Badakhchani. Find it in the uh, right-hand margin there at scotthorton.org. Also, The War State by my friend Mike Swanson. It's a great history of the rise of the military-industrial complex after World War II. And also, he gives great investment advice at wallstreetwindow.com. Buy your precious metals from Roberts & Roberts Brokerage, Inc. They do great work. They've been around since the 1970s. They uh, charge a very low premium. They charge no premium at all if you buy with Bitcoin. That's Roberts & Roberts at rrbi.co. Get it? R-B-I? rrbi.co. Well, I played t-ball when I was a kid. I'm, I'm more of a skater. You understand, but still. 
All right, libertystickers.com for your anti-government propaganda. 3tediting.com to make your book read, write. Tom Woods Liberty Classroom so that you know a bunch of stuff about how things work. Darren'sCoffee.com if you like waking up in the morning. And ExpandDesigns.com. You want a brand new 2018 model website? Come on, your website, man, it's old, it's out of date. You need a new website. You go to ExpandDesigns.com slash Scott and you save 500 bucks. Listen, we've already gone so long about this topic. Let me uh, change the subject here to uh, 2007. Speaking of the wife, she debunked this back then in the fall of 2007. The Israeli attack on the supposed nuclear reactor being built in Syria. And in fact, one of her major points, I forget, there were two or three different articles about this that she wrote for Raw Story. But one of them was, oh yeah, well where's all the graphite, says the anonymous IAEA source who was on scene and saying this was not a nuclear reactor. So it was funny because when I posted your article on Twitter, one of the original responses was, oh yeah, well that's not what the IAEA says. And I just thought, well, that's funny because that's what IAEA sources told my wife 10 years ago, <laughs> and that's what IAEA sources are telling Gareth Porter right now. Yeah, yeah. So I what's mean, the I, difference there, Gareth, between the original, re- between the official report and right. you guys' journalism? Right. The official report, which, of course, Ali Heinonen is really responsible, was really yeah, responsible. Yeah. Well, there for. you go, everybody. <laughs> Ali Heinonen, ladies and gentlemen. Now, now, of course, a senior advisor to who? The Foundation for the defense of democracy. You don't say. I do say. And uh, go ahead. Uh, so, so his his allowed his true colors to show through. Now, he he made sure that the IAEA covered up the fact that there was no uh, nuclear grade graphite found on the scene. Uh, made up various uh, stories or various uh, arguments to try to cover that uh, at various times over a few years. Uh, but but what the IAEA reported was that finally in 2012, if I remember correctly, uh, they said that yes, we found graphite, but we we have not been able to establish whether it was uh, nuclear grade or not. Well, I mean that's absurd. Uh, you know that, and I quote uh, Berad Nakai, who was uh, a, a senior researcher, uh, nuclear researcher at Oak Ridge National Lab for many years, uh, saying that that doesn't make any sense at all. They have the tools w- with which they could determine that very easily. So so that was clearly a lie. <laughs> all right. So now convince me then, and look, I know, I mean, Giraldi and Pat Lang and all these, in, you know, connected intelligence sources back 10 years ago were saying this was definitely not a nuclear reactor for the following, all kinds of reasons. And I'm not positive about this, but I'm pretty sure that Robert Kelly was, I think this may be the first time he ever publicly started debunking some stuff. The former IAEA inspector Kelly and um, and the Leverett's, I'm pretty sure, were good on this back then. Nobody who's you know critical of this kind of thing bought into the story at the time. And yet... Uh, still the burden is on you because officialdom says, Gareth, so you tell me why to believe instead it was, what do you say, a missile depot here? Or it was some kind of decoy target yeah, for, for some kind for, of deal? And I mean, why didn't the Syrians object to being bombed? They must have been right, guilty right. and all these things. You know the narrative. Debunk it. Yeah, there's, there's, lots, of, there's lots of different questions here that, that uh, I, I try to address in this piece uh, really for the first time in, in a uh, fully uh, developed fashion. Um, and and the, the main thing I would say is that um, the, the, the expert at the IAEA, the, the guy who really knew the kind of nuclear reactors that supposedly, the, the kind of nuclear reactor that was supposedly built in the Syrian desert, which was a, a graphite uh, uh, moderated uh, reactor and, and uh, one that's the same, it was based on the supposedly the North Korean reactor at Yongbyon. Uh, and he was an expert on that. He had visited the, the Yongbyon reactor many times, like like 15 times uh, uh, over a period of years, and had long conversations with the people who ran and uh, had designed and ran uh, that reactor at Yongbyon. So he knew it better than anybody else in the world outside of North Korea. And, and he looked at the CIA video, the 11 minute video that they put out in 2000, in April, 2008, CIA did and said, no, (laughs) this is not possible. Technically it just doesn't add up at all. 
and and ticked off you know five or six reasons why uh, it it couldn't have been a reactor. Uh, so so I, without going into detail, I mean I'm telling your your listeners that that he gave a very detailed technical analysis to uh, Alberadi, who was of course at that time the head of the IAEA, and Ali Heinonen, who was the deputy head of IAEA for safeguards. And what he found out very quickly was that they weren't interested in his expertise. They did not want an expert to get involved in this. Why? Because clearly the fix was on. The IAEA was going to support the U.S.-Israeli position on this because of, obviously, for political reasons. Mm -hmm. And so El Baradai was just not in the chain on this one, or what happened with that? Because he was a pretty responsible head of the IAEA. Well, uh, this happened in early 2008 at the time when he had decided to go back to uh, Egypt to run to be president, to try oh, to run okay. for presidency. So he needed the United States support. That I didn't get into that. I've, I have not published that as far as I can recall. But I guess that doesn't surprise uh, as far me. As, as far as I'm concerned, that that is the key to understanding why Alberadi didn't put his foot down and let El, let let Oli Heinonen get away with this criminal uh, activity uh, surrounding both both uh, uh, the the Syrian case and the Iran case. Yeah, he I did, mean, he, he is Mohammed Al Baradi is you know guilty of heroic obstruction of. America's lies about Iran in the 2000 aughts there in the Bush years in in debunking their narratives about Iran's nuclear weapons program. He if it hadn't have been for him, you know what I mean? That's one of those alternative well, histories I all, hate to up, see. So this is a real up. disappointment that a guy a guy who would go to such heroic lengths on Iran would then turn right around and kowtow on something like Syria like this. Well, but he, he first stood up to Bush on Iraq. In 2003, that was that's his true, right? He 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 told the Congress before the war that he had debunked the Niger uranium forgeries in 30 minutes with Google. Well, he he told the UN Security Council. In fact, that was that was oh what right he did. right that right was what right right that's what that's what enraged uh, the neocons in the Bush administration against against Alberti. And then you're right that in in 2005, 2006, 2007, he was a break on the U.S. Uh, and, and Israel. But 2008, he began to pull back and let Oli Heinonen take care of the problem. Now, why would he do that? There's no question in my mind that it's because he had political ambitions uh, in Egypt and he knew that he couldn't afford to push too hard on the United States. Mm -hmm. All right. So now, I'm sorry, go back to to uh, this building and what it really was and and what the what you think the you think the Israelis knew good and well, it was not a nuclear reactor, but they wanted to bomb it anyway. They wanted they to wanted, get America to bomb United it States, first, right? They wanted the United States to get into a war with the regime in Damascus. This was the way that they saw to do it. And of course, we know from uh, you know Bob Robert Gates' um, uh, memoirs that Cheney was in on it. I mean, clearly he was the one they were relying on to get the decision within the Bush administration in favor of the Israeli proposal that the U.S. carry out bombing of this site. And Cheney said, "Let's go beyond that. Let's go after other military targets, including Hezbollah and Syrian uh, uh, weapon sites, meaning missile and rocket sites." Uh, so, so that's the that's the real background here. But then there's more to it, which I point out, and that is that Hayden and Cheney and that whole gang that involved John Bolton and so forth, they wanted to attack this uh, issue to get at North Korea in order to kill the negotiations that Condi Rice was carrying on with the North Koreans, which were was anathema to the neocons. And so this whole case that was made was also a device, a very useful device to to kill within the administration the idea of negotiating with North Korea. And they, in fact, uh, managed to do that in 2008, 2009. All right. Now, so part one of this is called Israel's Ploy Selling a Syrian Nuke Strike. It's at uh, consortiumnews.com and also reprinted at antiwar.com. And then same goes for 
the sequel, part two, uh, is that Consortium News, and it will be on antiwar.com tomorrow. This is the, the follow-up here, how Syrian nuke evidence was faked. And uh, we'll have the links to those in the show notes for everybody to check this out, too. Very important story, even if it is a decade old here. Uh, certainly helps, uh, you know, f- uh, provide for the frame of reference about who's who and which side they're on in the current conflicts. Uh, very good. That's the great Gareth Porter. Again, first and foremost, and by popular demand, too, translated doc debunks narrative of Al-Qaeda-Iran alliance. That one is at the American Conservative Magazine and then at Antiwar.com and at Consortium News. Again, Israel's ploy selling a Syrian nuke strike and how Syrian nuke evidence was faked. The book is Manufactured Crisis, the Truth Behind the Iran Nuclear Scare. Thanks again, Gareth. Thank you, Scott. All right, you guys, and you know the deal. ScottHorton.org, FoolsAaron.us for the book. Buy the book, Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, LibertarianInstitute.org, Antiwar.com, and follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Thanks.